Welcome to the Adelaide Festival of Ideas and to what I know will be a spicy session indeed, the case for perfection. As a science journalist um, focused on the mind and self, I find this interface between technology, science and the self utterly compelling. How will new technologies change who we fundamentally are, how we think, how we behave, what we define as essentially human, and also what we define as natural. Certainly in the 1980s, the fantasy uh, was the cyborg, part machine, part person. And we had that spectacle of the hybrid being, the Terminator, which was, I guess, to some, a spectacle of a monster. And today, our utopic and possibly dystopic visions are, are perhaps more molecular, aren't they? Pharmaceutical enhancements drugs that keep us awake, that boost our memory, that perhaps wipe out traumatic memories, um, or even genetic enhancements before we're born, perhaps. And this is where things get interesting, contentious, perhaps. How far do we take genetic screening before birth? What do we screen out? Who gets to decide? Whose vision of perfection are we fulfilling when we do? And certainly one of the most provocative and interesting uh, speakers that I've seen speak on this topic that I've interviewed before on this subject is our special festival guest today. He's an Australian lad, a bioethicist based at Oxford University. Professor Julian Savalescu is, he has multiple hats. Apparently he's a catnapper, which is how he manages to fit in sleep. He's director of the Hero Practical Centre for Practical Ethics in the Faculty of Philosophy. He's director of the Oxford Centre for Neuroethics and the Institute for Science and Ethics. He has countless gongs to his name, including one here in Australia, which means that he gets to come back home for two months each year at Monash University, where he is the Sir, uh, Sir Louis Matheson Distinguished Professor um, at Monash University there. He doesn't mince his words. I think you're in for a very interesting session. Can we please give him a warm welcome? Thanks very much, Natasha. It's a great pleasure to be back uh, in Australia and also for my second time in Adelaide. Um, Steve Jobs died a couple of days ago and I was reading the obituaries um, uh, a couple, uh, yesterday on the plane. And people were talking about his achievements, introducing the Macintosh computer. I recently bought one, the iPhone, the iPad, and you know, what great inventions these were. But, but what are these things that, that Jobs created? Well, effectively, they're either cognitive enhancers. The iPhone is an incredibly powerful tool for enhancing our ability to record information, remember things, manipulate that information, access the internet and the World Wide Web, uh, or mood enhancers, things that make us happy listening to music and so on. So, so Jobs is really just one of, of an enhancement revolution that is going on all around us. So I've written quite a lot on physical enhancement, enhancement in sport, and cognitive enhancement. Um, for the last eight years or so, I've been working on the, the ethics of enhancing cognitive ability, and recently that's come to the popular um, media through films like Limitless. But today I'm going to talk about a different kind of enhancement. Not physical enhancement, not cognitive enhancement, but moral enhancement. And my idea for the Adelaide Ideas Festival is that we can and should enhance people's moral capacities by using technology, and I'll talk a little bit about how we could do it using biotechnology. So many of you will be familiar with Anders Breivik, um, who earlier this year killed 77 people with automatic weapons and another eight with a bomb uh, outside of the government buildings in Oslo. Most of his victims were, were young people at a uh, Labor Party uh, camp. He said that the Labor Party had to pay the price for letting down Norway and the Norwegian people. He published a 1,500-page manifesto, and in fact was an avid cognitive and physical enhancer. He took a number of drugs to improve his performance in various ways. He was worried that that Norway and, and Western Europe were being taken over by Muslims. 
uh, there's been interest in whether there is evil intrinsic to human nature, whether some people are born evil. This um, film we need to talk about, Kevin, is about a boy who comes to become a mass murderer. Steven Pinker, the famous Harvard psychologist, um, in a book called The Science of Evil, said that genetics and neuroscience are showing that the heart of darkness cannot always be blamed on parents and society. Uh, there's a famous uh, psychologist in, in London called Essie Veeding, who's done a lot of work on what's called callous, unemotional personality in children. These are children who are very cold and torture animals. A large proportion of these children come to be psychopaths uh, as they enter later life. In fact, a few uh, weeks ago, I read an article in The Age in Melbourne of an Australian researcher who's writing in a similar vein, Mark Dads. He described um, what he called cold children. One in 200 children, uh, he, uh, he says, cold. They don't react emotionally. They don't care about other people's feelings. They're hard to discipline. They show little remorse. When he took 100 children aged 5 to 16 with this cold disposition, which he's called oppositional defiant disorder, and screened out the parents for abuse or mental illness, drug and alcohol problems, and screened out children for other behavioural problems, he watched these children and their mothers playing. And as the mother told them that the children, the, told these children that she loved them. What he found was that these children were not different to other children in terms of their ability to communicate, um, and nor were their mothers different in their ability to communicate their love to the children, but these sorts of children don't return the mother's love in obvious ways. They show little response to the mother's love and avert her gaze. The, parents, the fathers of these children also show cold characteristics, and this researcher believes that these children can be modified to become more empathetic and more loving. So the idea that evil can be a part of our nature obviously goes back to the beginning of human history itself. Um, John Steinbeck, a famous writer from the United States from last century, in a book wrote, as a child may be born without an arm, so one may be born without kindness or potential of conscience. Now, modern science is starting to reveal the human moral limitations in the most extreme cases of psychopathy, psychopathy and sociopathy. Now, our world today is utterly different to the world that existed for any of our forefathers. Because of, a number, because of a number of different characteristics, but I'll focus on two. First of all, we have much more powerful technology than any human has ever had before. Um, Brevik killed 77 people with automatic weapons. Um, but in fact, we could kill many more people with the sort of technology that's available today. Around the middle of last century, humans acquired the capacity to destroy the whole of humanity through nuclear war. A number of experts, including the Astronomer Royal and the President of the Royal Society, Martin Rees, have estimated that perhaps the chances of us doing this this century with either nu nuclear, biological, or computing technology is 20 to 50 percent. Our technology continues to increase in power. So while in the middle of last century only a handful of people had the capacity to destroy the world. Many, many more today have access to uranium from the dozens of stockpiles from the former Soviet Union. Richard Posner, a Supreme Court judge in the United States, estimates there's enough plutonium to furnish 20,000 atomic bombs. So it only takes one Anders Brevik to not access some fairly crude fertilizer and automatic weapons but to access this kind of technology to kill many more people than 77. More scary still than nuclear weapons are biological weapons, because these in general are cheaper to produce and can be produced with much less sophisticated technology. On the top of the screen, you can see a mouse infected with a skin disease here. This is mousepox. Around 2000, um, scientists in Canberra were trying to develop 
a way of controlling the mouse plague in Australia by genetically modifying mouse pox virus to render mice infertile. Instead of rendering mice infertile, they produced a super lethal strain of this naturally occurring virus that killed 100% of mice. Now, they published their findings on the internet, and it was immediately obvious that you could do the same kind of genetic modification reasonably simply in a low-tech laboratory to human smallpox. Now, human smallpox ki has killed more people than any other infectious disease. Um, it's highly contagious and is an ideal biological weapon. At the moment, there are still stockpiles of human smallpox in, in uh, Russia, um, and the, the disease itself was eradicated through a vaccination program over 30 years. But the slide on the bottom right is of an artificially created virus, in this case, polio virus, artificially created using materials that you can buy over the internet. At the moment, smallpox is too large to create in a backyard laboratory, but given the exponentially increasing power of technology, it will only take a matter of years, perhaps decades, but probably much less, to be able to synthesise a genetically modified version of smallpox that would be an ideal biological weapon that people like Brevik and other fanatics, fanatics and psychopaths could use to kill millions of people with this disease. This scenario is depicted in the film 12 Monkeys with Brad Pitt and Bruce Willis. And, and often these science fiction movies are very well researched and, uh, and really take advantage of the curve of advancing technology to predict what might happen in the future. Now, given this hugely powerful range of technologies that we now have, the iPhone is just a sort of popular example, um, we also need to consider the nature of the beast that uses them. And as I said, ever since human history began and literature and art, evil has been portrayed as being a part as well as the, the goodness in our nature as a part of human nature. We're all familiar with sociopaths and psychopaths like Brevik, fanatics and ideologues. These disorders are not just um, things that arise through bad parenting or social uh, injustice. There is a strong biological component to these sorts of personality traits. Um, and this biological story is starting to be unravelled by people like uh, dads and Essie Veding and others. 75% of people in jails have an antisocial personality disorder and 25% are psychopaths. Now, even if this is not genetic or biological in any way, the fact is that if one of these people um, accesses the sorts of technology that I've been talking about, there'll be much greater disaster in this century than there has been so far. So that's one end of the, the spectrum of why we need to consider our own moral dispositions. But the second one is a much more important pervasive problem. Um, the second issue is that we all have not capacities for enormous evil, like Brevik, but very limited moral dispositions. And these limited moral dispositions have profound consequences when we collect them together in a modern world. Our moral dispositions, how we behave towards each other, whether we say we're sorry when somebody steps on our toes or whether we become angry when somebody offends us, are the results of the way we've developed as social animals. So over the last two to 300,000 years, human beings have evolved from the first Homo sapiens. But while our technology and society have gone through enormous changes in the last 10,000 years, in particular the last 100 years, our biology and our basic set of dispositions are the same as those that occurred in the very brief time in evolutionary terms from when we first emerged as Homo sapiens. Now, what was life like through virtually all of human history? Humans had to compete with each other for resources. They had to be fit to survive with their own hands and their own abilities by the time they reached adulthood. It was much easier for them to bring harm to their fellow 
human beings than it was to benefit them. Something like 40% of humans through most of human history died by homicide, being killed by another human competing for resources. Morality, what we call our um, moral norms, the sorts of things that we punish people for, evolved to enable humans to be stable enough to, to cooperate in small groups and um, survive as a group to pass on their genes to the next generation. But because of this very limited set of dispositions and this particular history, our basic dispositions are extremely limited. We tend to be biased to what's, what can happen in the very near future because through most of our past we couldn't affect things in one century. We couldn't even affect things five years from the time at which we acted. So we tend to focus on the, the near future. We also are much more concerned about what happens to the people close to us, the, our friends and family, those who we cooperate with. The basic size of a human group was roughly 150. Most tribes, most groups of humans existed in groups of 150 because at that point you can internally cooperate and enforce norms without some need for external policing or external um, law enforcement. So we're, we're geared up to deal with small groups, not big groups. We're not geared up to think about a world of six billion people. We, we tend to cooperate with each other, but only when we're observed. So when humans aren't observed, there is a basic tendency to free ride, to let others make sacrifices while you benefit. And I'll give you evidence for this. We're also distrustful of strangers and people who are from different races or groups because through all of human history, we had to be wary of our group members because they represented a threat to us and to the resources we sought to gain. So we're partial, we're, we're, we are altruistic, we do make sacrifices, but typically for our friends and family. And there's a reason for this, because if we made sacrifices for strangers, we wouldn't have survived because the strangers would have tended to exploit us or to free ride on us. So xenophobia is a part of human nature. And in, in fact, science demonstrates that even people even the best people, when you look at their reaction times and look at subtle measures of their reactions to our group members, have an element of fear and uh, distrust of our groups. Because it was very easy for us to kill, we had strong proscriptions, strong rules in every human society against harming members of your group. But that didn't extend to members of other groups. In fact, in many cases, you were required to kill members of, of other groups. What was most important to us was that we didn't cause people harm, but there was no right to ben there was no obligation to benefit people. We believe that we are responsible for what we've done, what we've caused, but not for what we allow to happen. So I'm not defending these dispositions, I'm describing what cuts across all human cultures. As I said, we tend to care about what happens to us and the people we care about in the near future. We are able to empathise and sympathise with single individuals, but not with large groups. There's a striking finding that um, people's willingness to give aid decreases as the number of people presented would, would be the recipients of aid. So if you want people to provide aid in a crisis, you show them a picture of a single individual. People are just not psychologically set up to deal in, in large, complex terms of, of dealing with collectives and large groups. Now, the second feature of our world today that differs from the world in the past is that it's hugely globalised. Events in one part of the world affect very distant parts of the world with lightning speed. And together with technological advance, this means we can affect other people to a huge degree that we could never do so in, in the past. So many modern problems are not just local problems. They're what are called global collective action problems. And I'll talk a little bit about climate change as an example of that. 
Now, because of the, but because we're not psychologically set up for a globalised world of six billion people, we're set up to think about a group of 150 people. That's what our natural dispositions are. We don't, in fact, aid people in other parts of the world when we could. We've the, the US has spent 3.1 trillion dollars prosecuting a war on terror in Afghanistan and Iraq. 3.1 trillion dollars. It's probably much higher now. This is a year or so when I looked at this figure. Um, in the last 50 years, the US has given two trillion dollars in foreign aid. So in the space of a few years, it's spent more than 50 percent more on war than it has on aid in the last 50 years. That's a striking illustration of how great we think it is to punish harm and how little we think it's important to, to benefit other people. In 2008, only five countries had reached the very modest United Nations target of donating 0.7% of their GDP to aid, and those countries were all northern European countries. The US and the Japan were the lowest contributors, giving only 0.2%. Why does this happen? Well, we believe that we're not responsible for failing to save people's lives, even though we could. We, we're, we can concern much more with what happens to people in our own country than what happens in other countries. Americans value, and the same would be true of Australians as well, value a life of somebody, a citizen of their own country, 2,000 times more than they value lives in other countries. Because of the sheer numbers of people who were affected by famine, such as, as in East Africa, to which we have to respond, we can't imagine what it's like for millions of people to be dying. We can imagine what it's like for one person to be suffering, but not for what it's like for millions of people. This, our insensitivity or numbness to numbers makes us prone to seriously underestimate the amount of suffering that we could, we could alleviate. Uh, and so we fail to give aid. Now, the situation isn't getting better, it's getting worse. Inequality relentlessly increases. The difference between the per capita incomes of the richest and poorest countries was three to one in 1820, it was 72 to one in 1992, and it must be more than 100 to one today. In 2000, the wealthiest fifth of the world's population stood for 86% of the world's productivity. The poorest fifth stood for only 1%. The richest three individuals in the world owned as much as 600 million people in the poorest countries. These are all symptoms of the limitation of moral disposition that we have as a result of our nature. People say we need a political solution to this. Well, our politics is a product of us as social animals, and what you see in the failure to deal with climate change through agreements in Copenhagen or Kyoto. It's just human disposition manifesting itself. So climate change is an example of what's called the tragedy of the commons, where you have a limited resource that multiple people want to use. Okay. In the classic example of this, it involved small-scale societies, so you had uh, a group of people in a town who wanted to use a pasture to, to graze their animals. And if too many people grazed their animals on the pasture, it would be degraded and useless for everyone. In these sorts of cases, people stop consuming only if they have good reason to believe that a sufficient number of other people will also stop consuming. And especially if this number wouldn't be sufficient without their contribution. So you'll stop your animal grazing if, um, if, your, if your contribution will make a difference and it's necessary for you to be able to continue to use that resource. Now, if these herdsmen know each other and can keep an eye on each other, they tend to cooperate. So if the numbers are small, you can keep an eye out for people who defect, who actually are using more of their fair share of resources. So the way in which these collective action problems that in, are involved in the tragedy of the commons have been dealt with through human history 
is through observation, policing, maintaining a small number of people that use that resource. That's how we've been able to prevent that sort of problem in the past. But that's not what the situation is with climate change. These sorts of problems are caused by millions of people who are anonymous to each other and have little reason to trust each other, who can't observe each other, and the huge number makes free riding and defection easy to escape notice. Um, and as the number of people grows in a problem such as this, each contribution is negligible. So there's very little reason for anyone to make a sacrifice. So the contribution to each of, our, of each of us to environmental degradation is imperceptible. So the prohibition that's built into our moral system, not to harm people, doesn't kick in. Because when, when somebody says you should reduce your, your carbon footprint, you can't see who you're harming. It's not like, you know, you're holding a hammer and you might actually hit somebody. You can say, well, don't hit that person. Our psychology is not set up for this. So, we won't solve climate change, is my prediction, through voluntary cooperation. First of all, because it's uncertain what the effects are. We're very poorly set up to deal with uncertainty. First of, and secondly, the effects will occur in 50 years' time, after many of us are dead. We're not psychologically set up to care about what happens in 50 or 100 years' time. The effects will be borne by people outside of Australia. Australia will be all right with climate change. We'll find ways of, of adapting to climate change. It's countries like Bangladesh and Southeast Asian countries who won't be able to adapt. That's where people will die or be dispossessed. And lastly, to deal with climate change properly would require quite significant sacrifice. If all six billion people alive today reached our standard of living, the impact on the environment would be 12 times as great as it is today, which is clearly unsustainable. Not everyone can live at our standard of living. So unless we're prepared to reduce our standard of living quite significantly, we're not going to be able to deal with climate change. The sorts, of, car the sorts of, of figures we're aspiring to reduce carbon by won't deal with climate change. We won't restrain our consumption or give up our lifestyles. Um, one survey after the Kyoto Protocol found that 52% of US citizens wouldn't support Kyoto if it cost them $50 a month. And only 11% would support it if it cost $100 or more. So th th this is data. Th th this, th what, what this shows is it's wishful thinking to think that people are going to voluntarily um, deal with climate change. So could biology change these dispositions? Could we become more altruistic, more willing to make self-sacrifices, more empathetic, better able to, to understand other people's suffering and emotions through our understanding of biology. Well, there are reasons to believe that we can and that we should. So our dispositions, as I've indicated, are, are built in to our nature as animals. And they're essentially elaborations of what's called tit for tat. The way in which we've most effectively cooperated with others is to offer cooperation to others and when they cooperate, we, we, we continue a pattern of cooperation. But if they defect or harm us, we punish them. And then you offer them the opportunity to cooperate again. These tit-for-tat dispositions can, are built into our biology and can yield a sophisticated range of emotional responses, like remorse and guilt, shame, pride, admiration and forgiveness. A number of experiments have been designed to test the disposition in humans and, and also non-human animals such as chimpanzees towards a sense of fairness or justice, what we think is a just arrangement or division. The so-called ultimatum game is a game where we test these moral dispositions. In this game you have a proposer, so in the case of chimpanzees, one chimp can offer a, dis a division of a reward. So say you have 10 raisins. The proposer can say, I'm going to get eight 
and you're going to get two. And the responder can either accept the two raisins, in which case the proposer gets the eight, or the responder can throw away all of the, all of the rewards. So both of them get zero. This is punishment for unfairness. So when it's done with chimps, it's found that they will accept quite unfair distributions. Two and eight um, is not uncommon. Humans, however, will tend to reject the reward altogether if there's any substantial unfairness, often greater than six and four. Okay, so people would prepare to suffer themselves and receive nothing if they judge that a distribution is what they consider to be unfair. But what's really striking about these studies is when you do them with identical twins, the correlation between what identical twins accept as a fair offer is much higher than twins that are not identical or between, twin, uh, between one individual and a stranger. So if one twin accepts six and four, the other twin is much more likely to accept six and four. What these sorts of, what this sorts of research shows is that a sense of fairness, what you judge to be fair, is at least around 50% a part of your genetic makeup. So whether you're prepared to tolerate injustice is not just a decision that you make, it's in part biological. I've talked about the enhancement revolution and the sorts of things that we're already doing to enhance our appearance, to improve our cognitive abilities, to improve our sexual function, to improve our physical function. Um, there are many currently effective cognitive enhancers. Limitless was based on uh, a currently available drug, modafinil, which was produced to treat narcolepsy, but improves attention and working memory. Um, it costs about the same price as smoking two packets of cigarettes per day to take every day. One study showed that 20% of academics are using drugs like this to improve cognitive performance. But much more powerful forms of cognitive enhancement lie in modifying the basic uh, genes and biological dispositions that shape our behaviour and who we are. Now, if, if you're, if you're sceptical about the power of biology to affect fundamental behaviour, you only have to look at the greatest genetic experiment ever conducted, which is the breeding of dogs from a small group of wolves over 10,000 years. You all know the difference between the 300 different breeds of dogs. You know, an Alsatian is smart but vicious. A Rottweiler is vicious. A Labrador is placid. A Chihuahua is irritable. These characteristics are genetic, caused by selective breeding. But what we did over 10,000 years could be done in a single generation now by genetic engineering. On the left, you can see a rabbit which fluoresces in the dark. This shows, it was produced 15 years ago or more, shows that you can transfer genetic material from one species, a jellyfish, into another species, a rabbit, and it expresses that trait, that thing that the gene is responsible for. It makes the rabbit fluoresce in the dark. There are also fluorescent monkeys and so on. On the right, you can see an embryo which is fluorescing in the dark. That's a human embryo caused by doing exactly the same thing a couple of years ago in the United States. Now, that embryo was destroyed, but if it was allowed to develop and you produced a baby, the, that person would fluoresce in the dark. This is not moral enhancement, but what it shows is that you can change fundamentally the way that we look and the way that we are by using our knowledge of biology and the biological revolution. We're a part today of not an industrial revolution and not only an information technology revolution, we're part of a biological revolution. I'm going to show you a, a video now which is not about moral enhancement. It's about the power of biology to change the nature of human life. You'll see in this, in this um, video two mice running on a treadmill at 20 metres per minute. One's a normal mouse and the other mouse has had a small change genetically engineered in the glucose cycle, the sugar cycle. So at at the front, you can see 
the genetically modified mouse. At the back is the normal mouse. They both fall off and get back on. They're looking for food, they're hungry, and they're running for it. So after 200 metres, the normal mouse at the back is exhausted and can't continue, doesn't get back on, despite being extremely hungry. The genetically modified mouse goes on not for 200 metres, but for six kilometres, for several hours. So this isn't science fiction, and this was done to look for the treatment of diseases and muscle wasting conditions and so on. But the message of this is that not only is the iPhone a powerful device and computers are a powerful device, inside our cells is a huge power that can be modified and changed. We've done this to animals. We've produced mice with enhanced memory, mice which live twice as long, and I'll talk in another session this afternoon about immortality, mice um, which are... Which, um, are able to run much further, monkeys which are more hard working, voles or, or small rodents that are monogamous instead of polygamous. So all of these characteristics, even sexual behaviour, is affected, obviously affected by our biology and can be changed. So could we do this by change, could we change our moral dispositions by doing these sorts of things? Of course in principle we can. And there's even emerging evidence that pharmacology, the state of the um, hormones and neurotransmitters, the sort of chemicals in our body, the level of those chemicals affects how we behave towards each other. So serotonin is a um, neurotransmitter, a chemical in the brain that regulates activity in certain areas of the brain. Many people are on drugs which affect this chemical. These drugs are called Prozac or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. The name doesn't matter. But many of the new, new generation of antidepressants affect this chemical. So around the world there are millions of people and there are probably hundreds of thousands of people taking drugs. Perhaps some of you, my mother takes this drug for depression. If you've got lower levels of this drug you, in your brain, you behave more aggressively. If you have lower levels, you're also more impulsive. If you've got higher levels, you tend to cooperate with people. You tend to be m much easier to get along with and get along with people much more easily. So this affects your willingness to cooperate, which is a, which is a moral quality. It doesn't affect it hugely, but what this shows you is that drugs can have subtle moral effects. Another one which we've studied in Oxford ourselves is a blood pressure lowering drug called propranolol. This is a drug that was used for many years to treat high blood pressure and after um, heart attacks. It reduces anxiety. It also reduces our ability to remember things. Natasha mentioned the ability to reduce traumatic memories. The American military is using propranolol to look at reducing stress disorders in soldiers after battle, to stop them remembering the sorts of um, uh, trauma, the traumatic events that they've been involved in. It increases conservatism um, and it has effects on fear and disgust. We showed in Oxford that if you give people this drug, you reduce their tendency to put down or what's called derogate or to treat adversely people from out groups. So you become more tolerant of people outside of your group when you're on this drug. As I mentioned, drugs like Prozac um, increase cooperation, reduce criticism of others, mean that people in that, in that game, which I talked about before, the ultimatum game, are much more willing to accept... Um, sorry, much more willing to punish unfair distributions of, of the single resource. So when you're on this drug, you, you tend to aim for a much more even distribution of resources. Oxytocin is another drug that's, that, that's also a natural substance in the brain. Women release it when they're breastfeeding. 
It's present in the brain and also in the blood. This drug is released by the oral contraceptive pill and glucocorticoids, which are used for the treatment of asthma. When you give people this, which you can give in spray, it increases their willingness to trust other people, their trustworthiness. It increases their cooperation within their own groups, but reduces their cooperation with our group members. So I've mentioned the cognitive enhancers as well. Psychiatric drugs also have moral effects. Perhaps the most striking of these are drugs that are given to paedophiles to reduce their sex drive, the so-called anti-libidinal drugs. These drugs are aimed at controlling the sexual behaviour of people who have committed crimes involving sexual aggression to children. Many of the world's problems, like poverty and climate change, today require us to behave in ways that we're not naturally disposed to behave. That's not to say that we can't, and that's not to say that some revolution might, might cause us to behave in radically different ways than we have in the past. The human capacity to learn, to conform, to conform to ideology is, is enormous. These sorts of um, pressures could cause us to deal with the problems that we face today. Um, but today we face mass destruction through the actions of individuals, psychopaths, sociopaths, fanatics, ideologues, people like Brevik, people like Kevin, people like Ted Bundy, um, people like Joseph Stalin. These people will today have access to much greater technologies than they've had in the past. I haven't talked about how we could deal with that problem, but there are also ways in which we could use science to address those sort of problems. What I've talked about today is the much more common dispositions that we all have, which are limited, that mean that we're unlikely to deal, I think, with the problems that we face in a globalised, technologically advanced world. There is natural moral inequality. Some people are better people than others. Some people are evil. Um, no human characteristic is, is distributed equally. If you look around, you're all differing in height. You're differing in physical status. You're differing in your abilities and your disabilities. Nature has no mind to equality, and it has no mind to equality in moral dispositions. But the consequences of this kind of equality are profound, not just in, in terms of the consequences for an individual, and I've talked a lot in the past about the consequences for individuals of cognitive limitation, but for the whole existence of humanity and society in general, of these moral dispositions and inequalities and dispositions. Now, we can, we can intervene by um, identifying individuals with, say, callous unemotional personality or oppositionally defined personality disorder, giving them additional support, giving them interventions to try to increase their empathy. We can use modern techniques of surveillance. We can try to tailor our policies, our political policies, to target the, the psychological biases and limitations that human beings have. Well, you don't see politicians using this kind of science to, um, to, to tailor their policies. What you see, typically, is some ideological perspective, ignorant of the human condition, in just the same way that communism was ignorant of human motivation. But what I believe we should also do is look at enhancing our moral dispositions, not just through education, not just through psychology, but also by understanding our biology, by understanding the biological revolution that I described. I'm not arguing that we shouldn't employ education, psychology, political strategies, social interventions, etc. We should do all of those things. The problem is so great. But it's time to look not just outside to what we can do outside, but to inside and how we can look to improve ourselves, not just by reading um, Socrates or Buddha or the Bible, but also by looking at how we're disposed to relate to other people and to react in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Stay with us. Now, um, we have some time for questions, and I'm sure you have 
many questions. And I might kick us off. Um, I guess one question I'd have is that genetically modified mouse that's uh, able to walk six kilometres relentlessly in search of food as, as opposed to 20 metres, is that mouse happy, do you think? Um, so so the, 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 it's interesting. The, these, this mouse can reproduce to the equivalent of, of the age of 80, but it's also much more aggressive in the cage. Um, so it, it, it's, it's, it's more active in lots of ways. Is it happier? I don't know. Um, the doogie mouse, which has better memory, is also more susceptible to pain. What this shows is that some advantages have trade-offs. But if you want to engineer happiness, you can do that too. Because how happy people tend to be is not a function of their external circumstances, it's largely an effect of their internal biology. So if your goal is to make happy as well as stronger mice, you, you, really, you really just need to understand the biology more completely. Now, it's true that we don't understand that at this point, but it's my prediction that, that in, in the next 10 years or so, we will have a much greater understanding of how we can manage those trade-offs. Let's come to questions. Thank you very much. First one. Thank you. Um, on your slides, I noticed you mentioned the second human enlightenment. Could you just uh, suggest how you think that might have affect the outcome, or what well, it is? So, so, I mean, we 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 are the products of evolution, which doesn't select for any particular quality, except being able to live long enough to reproduce. But we are now in the position to argue to to design ourselves to not just reproduce or live long enough to reproduce effectively, we're in a position to try to, to understand what we want to achieve as human beings, what sort of life we want to lead, to be masters of, of our own destiny. Now, what I've tried to argue in this talk is one of those aspects that we will have to ask us is how moral do we want people to be and should we be attempting to use our knowledge and our science to realise that. So the second human enlightenment will be choosing what kind of people we are according to what we value. Ah, so much to be said there. What about equity of access to enhancement? But that's another question. Can we come to the next question? Thanks. Um, when I was a young person, I used to love Aldous Huxley, Brave New World. Considering what you said today, how close are we to producing alpha, beta, gamma children? How are we to control uh, our reproduction and produce the type of children we want? Well, we, we already have alpha, beta and gamma children. They occur naturally. <laughs> so um, so the, the issue is, is how, should, how close are we to be able, able to making choices? You can choose the the dispositions that your, your children have to disease at the moment. So you can do genetic testing for major diseases and even for minor diseases. At the moment, you can't select for characteristics having to do with, with physical or cognitive or affective abilities or, or states. So you can't, you can't choose those sorts of things in a fine way, except for choosing the sex of children. You can choose for a limited number of those things. So I didn't mention, I skipped over this thing. There is a gene that's been associated with criminal behavior, a monoamine oxidase, a gene in, involved in, in metabolism of, of, a, of a neurotransmitter in the brain. Now, when, if you have a specific change in this gene, together with early childhood deprivation, you're much more likely to end up in jail and to be a, a criminal. You could select against that gene today using genetic technology. You could, you could have children which don't have this gene. Now, we, so we're starting to have the capacity to choose what kind of children we have in the sort of way that Aldous Huxley tried to, um, tried to portray, but it will be five, ten years before we're able to do whole genome analysis of embryos. At the moment, you can only test for a small number of genes. There is no reason in principle why you won't be able to test for every gene in, in embryos and select various characteristics. 
what kind of choice you make um, is a different issue. Now, Huxley had one particular view. I give a talk on this, and one, one, I did an interview on this. When they, they engineered monkeys to be harder working rather than lazy. And the, and the person interviewing me said, well, does that mean we should be engineering all of our children to be harder working? Well, that's a question we have. To, at the moment, there are some people who are harder working, some people who are lazier, or you know, monkeys that are harder working. It's a, so nature gives us a distribution. It's up to us to ask, is that the right, the right distribution? Is that the right sort of characteristic to have for that individual? The guiding principle that I think should operate in all of this is we should choose those genes which give that individual the best chance of the best life, while also ensuring that that individual is not a th significant threat to, um, to people, to other people around them. And I think that's quite a useful um, place to start. Of course, where we end depends on how we discuss the issue. Thank you. I was wondering about the problem of this type of research not being used to make people more moral, but perhaps being used to make them more amoral. And what I have in mind is one day on the radio, I heard that um, most killings in war are committed by actually a fairly small percentage of soldiers. And that um, the American military was doing some um, research into this. Uh, for what purposes, we don't know, but you know, you could imagine to try and develop some sort of super military which has a greater capacity to kill or win in wars. And I was wondering if you could comment on if we can genetically, en if we can genetically engineer more moral people, then we can certainly gener genetically engineer more amoral people. So, um, yeah, it will be done. <laughs> the US military is a huge investor in this project, and they're not doing it because um, they want to make the world a better place. They're doing it for their own specific aims. There is a trait called psychoticism. Okay, so psychopaths are at one end of a spectrum. All of these personality disorders are at an end of a spectrum. And this, but this trait, psychoticism, ranges from all the way from psychopaths to what are called hard-headed people. People who are often, the, the, who head corporations, who can make tough decisions, who are more willing to sacrifice people um, for the sake of some goal, okay? In fact, we did a study uh, of, of people with this tray in Oxford and showed exactly this. So if you, if you want to engineer better soldiers, you should select those who are higher on this psychoticism scale. Now, could you change that disposition? Well, of course you could. Um, you could. You can make people more aggressive just as you can make them more placid. So the, the downside of powerful technology is that not only can it be used for, for great good, it can be used for great, great ill. I haven't talked about how we should regulate the use, the dual use, it's sometimes called, of these so-called moral technologies. But what you can be certain is the, the US, pilots in Iraq and Afghanistan already use modafinil, Ritalin, Adderall, drugs to improve their cognitive performance. They're already using propranolol to try to affect the memory consolidation of their soldiers. You can be sure that they're investigating ways in which you can make people um, better able to achieve military goals. So here's what I'm going to do. We've got two minutes left. In the interests of audience participation, we can't go over those two minutes, but I'm going to get you all to ask your questions very quickly in sequence. You'll have about 30 seconds in total to do it, and I'll get Julian to do a wrap. At least then the issues are aired. So thank you. Just a very, very brief. All right, I have another reference to Huxley's Brave New World. The enhancing drugs that you talk about that make people more kind and cooperative seem very similar to the SOMA that they used in the Brave New World. And it seems to me that if it's going to make people more cooperative and, um, I don't know, even more placid, it's going to leave them vulnerable to exploitation and, you know, ultimately oppression. So what sort of realistically strong safeguards do you think would be available to actually prevent that? Would there even be any safeguards that could prevent that? Next one. Thank you. I hope you're happy with me taking this approach, but it's just great to hear what, you, your, what you're thinking. I think it's um, one thing to say that we should um, change the mor morality of psychopaths and sociopaths. 
but it's an entirely different kettle of fish to say that we should change people so they're more likely to cooperate with something like the Kyoto Agreement. Do you not think this sets a bad precedent in politics where politicians can change society so they cooperate more fully with their policies? Thank you. Uh, I would have to say that I've somewhat been conditioned to uh, accept the view that the clergy are have traditionally been the guardians of morality. They uh, policed the moral landscape. In the 1850s, the first Irishman to be ever made a cardinal in the Roman Catholic Church was a Cardinal Cullen, C-U-L-L-E-N. And what he had to say was that uh, highly desirable to have a restricted curriculum for the, the poor and that uh, too much education would make the poor disinclined to follow the plough or use the spade. And uh, to my knowledge, that uh, set the policy that was remained in place until I left the country in the early 1950s. Mm. And uh, for all I know, it may still uh, be very much in evidence there. And I, I feel that uh, uh, there, there is a need to uh, look carefully at people in power positions in the society and at the sheer hypocrisy of their approach to uh, morality and it's all very fine to be talking about a level playing field in terms of the distribution of wealth. Mm, mm. I think the critical thing is the distribution of educational opportunity so that the kids have a real uh, chance of starting off in a level playing field and thank you if you don't have that then you you will never solve the moral problems thank you for your comment we're going to have to wrap there final comment from julian if i may and thank you for your com for your comments sorry to the last three of you who have been waiting patiently uh, i'm sorry for going on for so long look th i think they were very good comments and just one point women are in general more empathetic than men um, nobody thinks that somehow this disables them or leads to their exploitation. So it may well, it's a difficult question to, under, to ask whether people should be cooperative with their, their governments and so on. We, we need to understand what it is we want to enhance. Um, but the point I'll, I'll finish with at the, is, is, is this one. At the moment, we have a distribution of whatever quality you want to talk about, empathy, aggression, cooperation, whatever. We have a distribution. Is that the best thing for the world in which we live in today, or can we do better than that by trying to use ethics and science to shift that disposition to bring about better education of people uh, or to bring about greater challenging of our leaders uh, or more independent thought? Whatever it is you think is important, independence of thought, creativity, you have to ask, do we have it in the right measure? And if we don't have it in the right measure, how can we use science to get the right measure? Thank you. On that note, can we please extend our thanks? Thank you.